uh, interesting too. So uh, you think about SciHub and you think about uh, piracy. Is that, that's what what it is, right? Why uh, why should we even talk about it? Uh, the the idea is that before uh, open access was uh, was out there, uh, the idea was there. Uh, this concept of uh, guerrilla open access uh, was already there, and uh, it's we have to admit that it's part of the the reality of open access. Um, when uh, you think about uh, people in different uh, places thinking about uh, getting access to scientific articles, uh, they actually many of them uh, know that they are indeed available uh, for free, but these are unauthorized uh, means. Uh, and it's not a secret. If you are uh, explicit with what you are uh, interested in and you Google something like how to access pirated articles uh, or anything uh, similar, uh, you will get an immediate answer. And, uh, and, and it, it happens, it's unavoidable. Um, and several access, uh, answers, in fact, and as time passes, you do find uh, as the first results uh, on Google um, what uh, is active uh, now uh, at the moment. And uh, if you follow this over the years, you realize that there have been uh, many different alternatives and, uh, and, and websites that have, uh, that have uh, facilitated this. Uh, and of course, using these uh, platforms, uh, it's, I mean, we, we know that they are infringing uh, copyright uh, laws and, and access restrictions. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that they are being used by a large number of people uh, anyway. And uh, the question is why why does this happen, right? Why uh, maybe there is something uh, that we can we can learn about it. Um, so <clears throat> this uh, the title of this uh, article, of course, is really interesting. It says how uh, who's downloading pirated papers and uh, it says everyone. Uh, this is a uh, article in on science in uh, published in 2016, and uh, of course the title is really uh, really dramatic, and uh, but it has to do with uh, with actual numbers with uh, users of SciHub and other uh, and other websites. And as I said, the story is very uh, very interesting. When you um, look at uh, numbers, if you see there's a, a study from 20 uh, 22. Uh, where they are uh, in, they they ask a number of uh, had a sample of uh, academic researchers uh, all over the world, and uh, it's like more than fifty percent of academics admit uh, using uh, these websites, or but they um, are aware of it. And uh, there's a uh, small percentage of people who actually don't know that they exist, but uh, but the number of users is um, is is very large. If you uh, and here I'm showing you a. a a screenshot of the of SciHub uh, website, you can see that yesterday, uh, between five and six p.m., uh, there were one hundred and twenty-six thousand people people who used the uh, the, the website. So um, that's uh, that's definitely a lot, if you um, think about it. So uh, SciHub probably is something that or or a website that you are familiar with because of all the legal issues you have seen them in. In, in the news, right? Of course, if you think about it, SciHub uh, is hosting material without uh, regard uh, to copyright at all. And um, if you look at look at all the uh, the legal issues, there's a, a couple um, that it's a couple of uh, well, legal issues that are very uh, became very uh, popular uh, in 2015. Uh, the website was uh, suspended, but uh, the reality is that it came back almost uh, immediately. Um, and then in 2017, uh, the creator of SciHub, Alexandra uh, Elbakian, was uh, ordered to pay $15 million uh, to Elsevier in, in damages. And uh, the problem with uh, this and all the legal um, issues and all is that it's actually pretty challenging to enforce uh, any, uh, any legal uh, judgments. Uh, because um, if you uh, look at the story, they didn't even show up, right? There is uh, no legal defense, uh, and it's, uh, it's something that is very difficult to uh, to enforce. So um, at the same time, besides all the uh, legal issues, 
uh, this surprising uh, thing is uh, that SciHub has many supporters uh, out there. Uh, here um, I have from last year in 2023, the Electronic Frontier uh, Foundation uh, gave uh, Alexandra uh, uh, Elbakian uh, an award. And uh, you don't have to uh, try to try too hard uh, to find more information uh, about it. Uh, if you glance at the uh, Wikipedia page, which is taken access uh, yesterday, you can see that uh, there are lots of, uh, 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 there's a, actually a large number of uh, researchers who have uh, thanked SciHub uh, in the acknowledgments uh, sections of the, uh, of the articles. And uh, also, there are people who uh, mention how uh, different different names for uh, for the creator, uh, like a modern day uh, Robin Hood and uh, Robin Hood and uh, science and sciences uh, pirate queen, and uh, there are also some biological species that uh, are named after uh, after her, and uh, some people believe that uh, will probably eventually get a Nobel Prize for her work, which is. Uh, uh, very uh, interesting, and then the award that I uh, just mentioned. Uh, this uh, this acknowledgments to uh, to her in, in in articles is something that I I have seen uh, and also in, uh, in thesis defenses, uh, etc. That it it is something that uh, definitely is uh, is is out there. Um, <clears throat> so what did SciHub uh, do? Uh, if we put it in plain words, uh, basically 88 million uh, articles in PDF format were uh, were stolen by by SciHub. And here I have uh, a you know the graph that comes from the the, web, the website itself. Uh, SciHub uh, had a growing database of uh, PDFs uh, all the way to uh, 2021, and it's about 88 uh, million uh, PDFs uh, that were uh, stolen. And of course, these uh, these files are out there, and they are hosted by SciHub. And uh, but at the same time, they are uh, hosted by many other people. There are lots of uh, different copies of the uh, of the files. If you um, and and again, as I said, this is something that you can find right away by googling. Uh, there is a uh, this uh, website, Anas Archive that uh, well has a collection of 99 uh, well million uh, almost a hundred uh, million uh, articles in the form of PDF and that other people have collected as I say sci-hop is the, the famous one the popular one but there have been so many different ones over the years that have closed that have been uh, that are constantly uh, changing and uh, but the copies of these uh, articles are, uh, are are out there uh, hosted by uh, many volunteers, and that um, that, that that is uh, that is very interesting. Uh, I had this uh, question to uh, to myself, right? Uh, is it difficult to store a hundred million uh, PDF files? And uh, as of this month, uh, this year. If you have a budget of a uh, thousand uh, or fifteen hundred uh, dollars, uh, you could buy the equipment that is uh, sufficient to store uh, all these PDF files, organized and searchable. You could have your own copy of uh, SciHub. Uh, of course, hypothetically speaking, don't do it, right? That that uh, that's definitely copyrighted material. But it is uh, uh, it's crazy how things have evolved uh, over the years. This was not uh, the budget that you would have needed. Uh, just two years ago, uh, uh, this uh, our drives keep becoming cheaper and cheaper. This uh, network attached uh, storage units keep uh, getting cheaper too. And uh, building something like this is um, relatively um, easy, which is uh, it's the, the surprise here. Um, so why do people use uh, SciHub? And there are lots of uh, uh, stories out there about uh, People will needing access because their uh, their institutions don't have access to articles, and uh, you'll be surprised uh, here that uh, the main users uh, here in the U.S. actually come from uh, from students that from different uh, universities. You can see the different cities uh, right here. Uh, 
including uh, East Lansing, Michigan, where Michigan State University is. As uh, I was a graduate student at Michigan State, and I can tell you that we uh, at, at Michigan State uh, we had access to uh, we had access to everything there, articles and, and and textbooks and many different libraries and different services and the university makes sure that everyone uh, has access to to all the resources we want when as a student uh, there I can actually say that I was uh, uh, spoiled because I did, didn't ever have to think about not having access to 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 any uh, any of the resources so what is why is this happening if you have uh, students that do have access to uh, to articles why would they uh, use uh, sci-hop anyway um, and the reason is uh, is simple uh, convenience why is it convenient uh, this is just an example here I have the uh, article that I was just talking uh, about and here is the URL uh, this is the address uh, sci-hop works in a way that uh, you can change the address by incorporating the the sci-hub uh, URL uh, in front of this. Anything could go uh, after this uh, after this uh, slash uh, right there. Uh, the the OI, the address, many there are many different things. It will all point uh, to the uh, to the PDF uh, straight, and uh, can download a copy of the PDF, which is normally what users uh, uh, tend to to look for. The PDF that is uh, 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 what what you can read in online, uh, any any online uh, services where people uh, talk about why they use uh, Sci-Hub. And uh, this actually uh, made me uh, remember uh, that back in 2011, uh, I don't know if uh, you um, are familiar with this. Uh, this is a uh, hashtag, I can have PDF. Uh, this is actually a really, uh, really popular uh, hashtag uh, for, pe for people to request access to an article. If they go any social media uh, website and uh, using this hashtag, uh, then there will be someone out there who can uh, send you a copy of the PDF, uh, replying to your uh, to, to a tweet or anything, uh, anything like that. Uh, and it's just uh, unbelievably fast. People request and there is someone out there uh, who is willing to, uh, to, to help. And uh, and send the, the article. Normally, uh, people also uh, delete any any posts because you know to keep the uh, to erase the, the trace uh, so it doesn't uh, they don't find you uh, for requesting something uh, something like this. And uh, so yeah, this uh, has actually existed. This is from uh, as I said something that was uh, initially used in 2011. Um, and of course, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this is related to this uh, this meme from 2007. Uh, Ken has a cheeseburger. Uh, so you're eating some, and the idea is that share where you have, and somehow this uh, was a hilarious way of uh, requesting uh, access to a PDF. Um, so the here I, I have some. Uh, uh, you can find lots of uh, different. Uh, Articles and blog uh, posts and everything uh, about about this. I can has a PDF, and uh, it's all related to that. How uh, people uh, users are looking for uh, for the PDF uh, file uh, of an article. As um, and uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the motivations for the community are utilitarian. For some reasons, they feel that sharing uh, uh, articles is actually helpful uh, to everyone uh, else. And uh, I had never uh, seen this, uh, uh, the manifesto, the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto from uh, 2008. And, uh, but this is just one of the, uh, the paragraphs, just a few uh, paragraphs, but, uh, but it talks about how students, librarians, scientists have this privilege of uh, having access to, uh, to all the knowledge and how sharing it uh, has to, uh, it's, a, it's a duty. And if you say, it says, uh, you have a duty to share it with the world, and, it's, and you have. And for some reason, this is uh, this is true, even for people who are not even familiar with the, uh, the manifesto and are not uh, trying to advocate for anything like this. Uh, it's something that naturally happens, and you can see it because of the large number of users uh, who do this uh, out there. Uh, there is the uh, on, on Reddit uh, scholar uh, is the same thing. People uh, request an article, a chapter of a book. 
a thesis, uh, thesis or anything. Uh, and then people are, uh, people reply, people participate in this type of uh, discussions um, uh, online and people do get access to, uh, to that. Uh, this is again, one of the many uh, different websites that are out there, the Science Hub Mutual Aid that is relatively new. And as you can see, uh, 609,000 uh, requests for uh, PDFs have uh, already uh, happened. And this, this is, uh, again, uh, something that, that exists and is some of one of, uh, one of the options. And uh, so what, what did we learn again uh, by doing, uh, doing all this, by looking at this? Um, one of the, uh, the, the reasons why SciHub became so popular uh, is because it's easy to use. It's, it's so easy to find uh, a PDF. You know the URL, you know the UI. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to use, and, and that's uh, why uh, it became uh, popular. And then, uh, as I said, the scientific articles are available to the public, and uh, the damage is already done. We cannot uh, deny that, uh, even though it would be uh, uh, interesting to request uh, that SciHub uh, erases uh, these files. Uh, the reality is that these files have been around. Probably uh, a large uh, collection of PDFs had existed much uh, earlier uh, than that, uh, and the creation of uh, of, of Sci -Hub. And then, uh, well, Guerrilla Open Access is oops, Guerrilla Open Access is a uh, 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 reality, and uh, there are lots of enthusiasts. You can see uh, from the number for the uh, participation. Um, and uh, the other key is that it's becoming increasingly easier to store and organize large amounts uh, of data. And uh, they're uh, having so many initiatives uh, out there by, uh, by the pirate community where uh, these files are organized and uh, metadata uh, data is collected and, uh, and all that. And I think uh, there's something uh, there uh, that we can, uh, we can learn about um, this, the pirate uh, community. I want to uh, mention that. Uh, with that, uh, I'll say thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> thank you, Lewis. All right, next I would like to welcome <clears throat> Danny Schultz. Danny Schultz is the Director of Discovery Process Chemistry at Merck. Um, since joining Merck in 2014, Danny has been a member of the Process Chemistry and Enabling Technologies Group and became the director of the Discovery Process Chemistry Group in 2021, where she leads a group of process chemists in support of the Merck Small Molecule and Peptide Portfolio. Um, beyond her role at Merck, Danny has gained recognition worldwide for her scientific achievements and leadership, um, delivering over 20 invited lectureships. Her commitment to collaborations is evident through partnerships with several esteemed academic groups, including Macmillan, Schindler, and Sarat. These collaborations have resulted in notable publications and her expertise in the academic industrial collaborations is exemplified in her recent chem uh, nature chemistry perspective on the topic. Recognizing the significance of industrial publications and advancing scientific knowledge, Danny actively advocates for their importance and has participated in several uh, open access panels to share insights um, on how industry might approach open access. So this is a real great opportunity for us to hear, um, particularly from the academic perspective on, on this area. Thanks so much, Danny. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Sent a fresh copy this morning. So much happening. So I guess I'll just get started maybe while the slides are coming up. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, talk to you today. Uh, I feel honored to be one of the few uh, industrial folks invited to this workshop. I've learned a lot, um, kind of as Luis mentioned, um, over these past few days, I've taken really good notes. I'm going to take it back to our company and hopefully um, see how we can, you know, further work to advance open access and fair uh, data practices. Um, with that said, um, I hope today through my presentation, I convey to you why industry 
um, publishes, why it matters to hear the industrial perspective. I think some of the barriers that industry faces when it comes to publishing, and then also um, how we're starting to think about and work through open access and fair data, both within our company, but also externally as well. Maybe my slides will come up soon. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no problem. Hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Hey, there it is. Really skinny. Ah, oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Looks good. And see if I can advance. Oh, okay. I do, and it works. It works. I think we're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Um, so sorry about that, folks. Uh, so here's the title of my presentation, and I did want to give a bit of a disclaimer. This is a perspective. This is my perspective. It does not necessarily represent the perspective of Merck or the pharmaceutical industry as a whole, but I did have a lot of fun in crafting this content that I hope will lead to a pretty productive uh, panel as well. Um, and so I think a common misconception that we hear is that I thought industry doesn't like to publish. You like to patent. And while I cannot speak on behalf of the other chemical sectors highlighted here, I can say that overall pharma does like to publish papers. And our publishing philosophy at Merck is directly connected to not only our purpose, but also our values. And so as a company, we really believe in saving and improving lives around the world. And in order for us to rise to this really significant challenge and also opportunity, we really invest um, and hold ourselves to a really high standard with respect to the innovation and scientific excellence that we pursue. Drug discovery is incredibly hard. It's incredibly complex. It takes a really, really long time. We generate lots of data along the way, lots of really interesting results. And so naturally, it is our obligation and responsibility to do the best that we can to share that data more, um, uh, more broadly. And so to help folks kind of understand what the drug discovery process looks like and what we might publish along the way, I did want to go through this um, very simplified uh, drug uh, drug discovery schematic that's broken up into uh, that's broken up in, um, in into these three different stages. You have drug discovery, you then have the clinical trials, and then um, hopefully the launch. And so within the drug discovery space, this is when you're de dealing with tens of thousands of compounds, you're doing high throughput screening. You're looking for small molecules, you're looking for peptides, you're looking for monoclonal antibodies, you're trying to see if, if they're going to engage with your target. Um, you do design, make, test cycles, you go through this process um, for several years at times until you eventually arrive at a candidate that you want to take into the clinic. And it is at this stage in which uh, process chemists and formulation scientists and analytical folks get on board and we start to manufacture um, the drug in order to meet uh, the clinical trial needs. And then if all goes well, we have a drug um, and we file and um, and um, and all is well. But this takes a really long time. It takes 10 to 15 years. Um, and as a result of this, you know, we can only share so much at certain times. And so that's one um, you know, hurdle potentially for hearing from the um, hearing from the industrial community. But with that said, I did want to kind of emphasize why publishing um, throughout this cycle makes sense. And so within the drug, um, within the drug discovery space, uh, publications that you might see um, come out of here are really, you know, innovative drug, um, innovative drug, uh, drug design and also discovery, which includes synthesis. 
Um, in addition to this, there's lots of you know, shared problems amongst the pharmaceutical industry and also academia about um, you know, problems that you might face during drug discovery. One that we're actually uh, encountering right now is that with canonical amino acids, they are formally represented by a three-letter code. Those are very, very standard. But what about if you have a non-canonical amino acid? Um, this is then called a Helm code. And different companies like to come up with their own codes and not harmonize on it, which is creating um, a lot of stir. Uh, and so that's just one way in which we're just trying to work towards making a more harmonized vocabulary so that data sharing can become more fluent. Um, and then last but not least, uh, in vivo and in vitro studies are paramount uh, within this uh, preclinical space. We like to test anything um, before we take it in um, be, be, before we take it into people, but these models are really complex um, and they use life. And so as a result of that, sharing it um, any way possible is um, is uh, definitely a good thing. Within the process chemistry space, um, as we start to synthesize and manufacture these drugs, we really pride ourselves on developing green and sustainable man, um, green and sustainable manufacturing processes um, and sharing this more broadly uh, with the community really helps in hopefully curbing any sort of environmental impact uh, that these processes can have. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, safety. So we like our employees to go home uh, at the end of the day, and we want others to as well. And so all of our routes, um, we try to publish as much uh, rigorous safety data as possible, not only to share with other companies, but also the academic uh, community, which lags a little bit behind um, with respect to safety culture. So over the past few years, there's been editorials and perspectives kind of highlighting why hearing from the industrial voice matters. So hopefully you, you, you kind of have a flavor about the types of uh, work that we like to publish. And at Merck, um, there's four main reasons why we like to publish. Uh, the first one being that uh, it really helps advance and influence the field of science. We're working with um, you know, some of the best and brightest in the world. We have uh, really cutting edge technologies. And so any way that we can share this more broadly will hopefully benefit the scientific community. Uh, also, um, publishing gives us freedom to operate. So if we develop a manufacturing process and if we publish it, we can then use that process around the world. Uh, third, uh, it really uh, um, allows uh, the personal and employee development of our, um, um, of our employees through publishing. They are then able to uh, grow their resume. They're able to go out and give talks. And then uh, this leads into a positive feedback cycle where we're then able to recruit the top talent who then comes and works for our company. And then um, our fourth reason is the stimulus for scientific collaborations. As, um, as Olaf pointed out yesterday, by sharing what we're doing research on, we start to highlight and elevate uh, problems that we think are interesting, which are really fertile grounds for these um, academic industrial collaborations, which I'm going to get into a little bit more. But there are some deterrents uh, with respect to publishing. And I think um, an important thing to note that um, that, um, that is a contrast between academia is that publishing is not our top priority. Um, our top priority is to save and improve uh, human lives uh, through the advancement of novel pharmaceuticals. It is not to publish papers, and this is, I think, something that um, warrants mentioning. And so because it is not our top priority, this is usually something that folks do um, in their quote unquote free time. Um, and it takes a lot of time. People leave the company trying to find their old data. Um, and so um, sometimes you never see the light of day for certain projects because people have moved on um, and it's also just really complex. Um, speaking of complexity, the IP landscape is also incredibly complex. Uh, some companies have different postures on whether we should publish or whether we should patent. Some are more conservative than others. I'll get into this um, with a little bit more detail on my next slide. And then um, the final two statistics I pulled from this JMedChem paper, which was put together by some folks at BMS and also uh, GSK, which says that 20% of science in patents actually ends up in a journal. And then 5% of the science that we actually do within uh, industry actually um, is published. Uh, um, I'm not actually sure where they got this data from. They probably have really great librarians um, who did this for them, um, but the numbers seem about right from what um, I can gather as well. So diving a little bit more deep into this uh, JMED Chem paper, uh, it was a really interesting deep dive where they looked at 23, uh, uh, 23 pharmaceutical uh, companies 
And they looked at where um, the medicinal chemists were publishing and they pulled um, seven top journals. Uh, six of them are shown here. I went with six for the aesthetic purposes. Um, and out of, um, it, and they tracked the publication count over the past 20 years. And I think a few things should hopefully jump out. One, um, not all companies publish at the same rate. There are some large pharmaceutical companies that um, you know, pursue patents over publications. And the publication count overall is pretty low um, with respect to academic research labs. But I think um, the one uh, more startling thing that came out of this paper, at least to me, is that when they looked at the total number of medicinal chemistry articles published over the past 20 years, what they saw was a decline of around 25%. And so medicinal chemists are not publishing um, as much as they used to. They go into a few reasons for why that might be, um, but it was definitely um, the main takeaway is that you know publishing um, is, um, is declining overall within the medicinal chemistry community. So this paper got me really in, intrigued and I went to our Merck library uh, to ask how we're doing. How is our early discovery organization doing with respect to publishing? Um, and they did a really great job. And so within our uh, early discovery uh, departments, we have discovery, biology, pharmacology, and also translational medicine. And what you can see is that there is actually a downward trend um, towards the publications that we have. Um, and I would say that the huge spike in 2020 is probably from the pandemic when people had time and they were publishing more. Um, and so probably the more accurate numbers reflect the 2021 to 2023. Um, and so this was interesting. And then I thought, well, what about development? Um, the type of department that I'm in, uh, the process chemistry space, and um, they pulled the stats for us. And so um, within formulation sciences, analytical and also process research over the past few years, we see a more consistent um, track record of uh, more consistent track record of publications. Overall, the publication count is lower than what our discovery colleagues have. Um, but nonetheless, um, we do seem to publish at a more steady clip. Now, I think many of you are probably looking at the uh, yellow versus blue bars. I was also curious to know, are we publishing in open access journals? And I was really delighted to see that uh, within the discovery space, around 40% of our uh, papers are actually open access. And then within uh, the process chemistry space, around 21% um, percent average um, over these past four years. And we do this because we feel that um, hearing the industrial perspective matters, and by making these articles open access, we can have a broader reach. And I think one really nice example that I wanted to highlight was a paper that was published in OPRD in uh, 2017, which was um, about the Hofmeister series. It's an old principle, but we applied it to um, you know new uh, new um, we applied it towards new concepts as a general strategy for salting out molecules that you might be interested in. And so um, I think a few things to point out. Um, I think the publication count is now over 300. It's cited in more than 25 countries and the article views are very high. And so at the time that this was published, this was one of the top uh, one, this was one of the top one, 1% um, of papers published that year, just kind of showing that when um, industry does make their papers more, um, um, more accessible, you can see the kind of broad impact that can result from that. And so when we think about an open access future and how this could impact um, industrial publications, as um, I, I think as Sarah put really beautifully yesterday, we're pioneers and, and um, you know, being able to discover a drug and bring it to market is a huge innovative achievement. And I think anything that we can share along the way is going to be um, really important. And so when you think about open access, you know, having broad access to um, our data through healthcare providers and also researchers and the public is going to be really important. Uh, we really hope that this accelerates, um, you know, drug um, 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 drug discovery and also human health and also just prevents like reinventing the wheel, people doing things that have already been done uh, before. But uh, I think some unknowns that we're just not quite sure of is what are the, um, you know, article processing fees going to be? Um, and so there was this really nice uh, CNE News article published in uh, 2021 that kind of went into, um, I, I, I think this was when Model S uh, came out. And uh, as you can see here, the article processing charges vary um, significantly depending upon um, um, depending upon the journal. We, um, you know, at Merck have a budget just like um, just like everyone else. Uh, it is not bottomless. We cannot pay these fees um, all the time. 
Um, and so, you know, we do have, you know, questions about it, um, if the APC charges are, you know, significantly high, is this going to push some companies to potentially patent versus publish? Are they going to produce fewer articles um, as a means to save money? And then um, would they target a journal that has a lower APC, even though it may not be uh, the best fit? And then last but not least, um, you know, just some curiosity around what the data requirements will be. All of this to say, there's been some really great discussions about these, um, you know, institutional open access agreements, and I do wonder, you know, what they might look like um, within um, within um, an 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 industrial environment as well. So what I shared with you primarily is research that we're doing within our walls at Merck. Um, but what about how we engage with the academic? community. And so I would say that, you know, numerous pharmaceutical companies are involved in active uh, partnerships at Merck. We have more than 50 that span across the world. We do this for three main reasons. Um, we do this to build new uh, capabilities, not only at Merck, but also at, um, um, but also at different universities. Like we have established uh, these high throughput experimentation centers um, across the U.S. and also Canada. Uh, professional development is a really great way for Merck scientists to, you know, co-lead a project. It's really great for the PI and for the graduate students to kind of see a little bit, um, you know, behind the curtain about the type of research, uh, um, about the type of research that we do. And then last but not least, it's fun. So scientific curiosity, there's a lot of things that we are very um, interested in pursuing, but simply do not have the time for. And so by engaging with the um, academic uh, community, this is a way to kind of um, um, accomplish that. And so there's been a few articles um, written about why engaging with the academic in um, why industry should engage with the academic community more. And I think if you look at, um, you know, the pipeline over the past few years, it's becoming more and more complex. You're seeing um, antibody drug conjugates, you're seeing macrocyclic peptides, you're seeing uh, natural products. These are really beastly synthetic organic chemistry challenges. And so it only makes sense that we should leverage the entire um, you know, chemistry community in order to solve these problems. And there's been a few um, articles written about, you know, different models in which, um, 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 in which that, um, in which that can be done. And so one was uh, written in uh, Nature Chemistry by 2018 by a panel of different pharmaceutical companies. And then um, Elsie uh, Campo and I uh, co-authored this Nature Chemistry uh, review in uh, 2020, which is called Harder, Better, Faster. We love Daft Punk, but we also thought it really kind of drove home the point that if we're being asked to develop synthetically harder targets, better and faster, we really need to roll up our sleeves and, and, uh, and we need to engage. And so, um, and I, I think the crux of our article was really on why are we not seeing more of these academic industrial partnerships. And this was a theme that kind of came up yesterday. While it is incredibly important to engage with the public and do science communication, I also think it's really important for us to engage with each other across different sectors and, um, and lean into some vulnerability and some potential discomfort. And so what do I mean by that? Um, industrial chemists uh, tend to rely upon these battle-tested reactions. They may not want to innovate because they want to do what works and they want to deliver the drug ultimately. And then you have a professor up in an ivory tower saying, why don't you use my catalyst a little bit out of touch? And then you have someone who might be me saying, because your catalyst takes 15 steps to make and we only want to probably use 15 steps or less to make the drug that we are interested in, right? And so we're just not speaking the same languages. And so I would say that industry needs to do a better job about sharing the problems that we are in, um, that we are interested in. But I think academia needs to um, lean into the discomfort, needs to lean in and ask for feedback about why um, about why their inventions are not being used. So we've seen over the past few years really, um, you know, more leaning into the discomfort and really awesome uh, research uh, being done. Here's just a few notable uh, pub. Um, here's just a few notable uh, publications uh, um, amongst the community with um, with respect to academic and uh, industrial partnerships. Uh, and so those agreements were done between institutions and also the pharmaceutical companies. However, uh, you know, we are also, um, you know, companies can also engage in these goalie grants, which were uh, brought up uh, brought up previously. There, um, as of uh, January this year, there's more than uh, 300 of these goalie grants uh, going on that span um, a variety of different STEM fields. And um, I know that, you know, there's also these NSF uh, centers as well, which are really great um, opportunities to engage with the industrial community. 
So my last slide and last thoughts, I don't have any more content beyond this, is on fair data practices. I actually don't have much to share um, here. And I, and I think Bob put it really well yesterday um, in that we are developing internally our own fair data practices um, to try to ensure that the data um, amongst different departments and different groups is definitely accessible. Um, and uh, it's definitely a work in progress and uh, stay tuned and more happy to answer any questions on that in the panel. So thanks. Great, Danny. Thanks for the whirlwind tour. <laughs> um, okay, moving right along. I um, want to welcome the next um, speaker to our panel. Um, we're going to slide into support. Um, so from research to support. Um, our next panelist is Yi Li. Yi Li is the Librarian for Chemistry, Chemical Engineering, Material Science and Engineering at MIT. Um, she also serves as a trustee actually on the board of Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. And um, she served as a chair in 2023 of the ACS Division of Chemical Information. Um, she's also been active on the Force 11 Scholarly Communication Institute, um, member of the program committee, executive committee, and chair of the archive committee. And through research teaching and partnership with research and students, he has established her expertise in chemical information and um, literacy data management and sharing. And she's also been um, a librarian at, at uh, the Colorado School of Mines and the Michigan State no, Michigan University, University of Michigan. I always get them mixed up. I so apologize, <laughs> everyone. Um, so, and she's she's really been very active in the in the uh, exploring the role of librarians and supporting uh, scientists um, in in data management in particular. Um, she's been an active um, instructor in the data carpentry's um, work, for example. Um, so, I'd like to welcome you to talk about some of her experiences. Thank you. Oh, thank you very very much, Leah, and thanks everyone for uh, the invitation and the uh, uh, um, and it's my pleasure to talk about how we support uh, the research community with their open science and fair data practices today. And my apologies that I wasn't able to join you yesterday because uh, I was traveling to uh, uh, Scotland for the International Data Curation Conference. Um, but I heard that the, the conversation was really good, but pardon me if I'm uh, repeating some of the things you have discussed yesterday. Um, and so, um, as uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we probably have talked about yesterday, that um, <clears throat> the fed <clears throat> excuse me, for federal funding agencies' requirements on open science has been there and has been evolving in the past two decades. And during this whole time, uh, we have really come come a long way in terms of recognizing that open and equitable access to not only the publications but also. Oh, um, sorry, some. The, yeah, forgot to advance in the slides. Um, pardon me, I was just really highlighting that uh, in the past decades, uh, our open science policies has been evolving and uh, we really have come a, come a long way to recognize that open and equitable access really not only is, applies to the publications, but also for the scientific data, as well as all these other types of research outputs that will enable people to, to make progress uh, with research. And um, the policies are also starting to recognize those legal, privacy, ethical, technical, intellectual property, and secu security issues that may limit the access to data and also may have implications on researchers' practices. Um, and um, it's also recognized that we really have a broad range of stakeholders involved. And it's so great to have all of us represented in this workshop. Um, and it really takes a village to do it right, and we do need to um, we do need to, to really uh, join the force together to help to help translate the policies for the research community so that the uh, they can build the research practices. Um, and we want to translate it into different types of funds, um, and we also want to really improve the infrastructure behind the scene. To and uh, of course, finally, we want to provide guidance and support for good practices, and all those will help 
incentivize and also reduce the barriers for our researchers in the all different sectors to be able to make this happen on the ground. Um, and I'll just uh, briefly talk a few talk about a few examples uh, in my uh, part of the world to illustrate some of these um, uh, uh, this effort. Um, and uh, National Academy actually has this other roundtable uh, working on the incentives um, and the motivations for different uh, for researchers in different sectors. Um, majority on the academic sector, but they do talk about uh, incentives for different sectors to contribute to to open science. So I don't um, I don't wanted to repeat those. Um, uh, uh, things they have worked on now, um, uh, but I just want to highlight like what's most important maybe for our in chemistry part. Um, yeah, so uh, as at MIT, uh, the first thing happened earlier was uh, we made sure that this faculty driven open access policy was in place so that our researchers and students are empowered and supported from the policy level within the institution so that they can go out there and say like this is really required as a part of my institutional responsibility um, and um, uh, so um, in the meantime uh, sorry, just in the meantime uh, that would allow the library uh, to really provide those support that aligned with the, the, the institutional uh, policies and we are for the from the library perspective, we're, we're really strategizing our investment um, in uh, originally in the information resources um, now to make them as um, open access publishing funds, um, investment in open infrastructure, and other sorts of ways of um, helping our researchers to uh, get to get um, their feet wet within this new landscape. And particularly, uh, uh, I want to highlight some of the challenges for chemists to to, to take advantage of the all this support uh, happening on on at this level. So, for, from the publishing perspective, um, the funds provided for OE publishing by uh, library or institutions may not be sufficient to cover um, the full cost of the general publications in chemistry, because many of our um, uh, cost for publishing uh, in chemistry. Is particularly expensive comparing to compared to other fields uh, that were studied on before, and I didn't cite them today, but uh, you know, we can see that it, that's even before the transition to the more open way of publishing. Um, and other a second part is uh, most of, many of these agreements we have in place between the libraries and uh, um, the publishers um, may not um, really uh, cover all all the major publishers within the chemistry domain. Um, and plus, uh, I hope that I believe that we might have talked about this yesterday a little bit. The article process, uh, article processing charge, uh, the APC based model may not um, be equitable and sustainable uh, in many cases. And um, so uh, that pro proposed another, pose another challenge. Um, then uh, when it comes to the open infrastructure in investment from the library, um, sometimes uh, the, at this point, at least, um, the investment in those disciplinary specific infrastructure is, has not been prioritized from the library and uh, in, in academia. So, um, and, and, and uh, speaking of the sustainability and equity for uh, those um, uh, agreements uh, in terms of uh, written publishing and so on, or transitional agreements, um, so uh, in, in order to move the needle a little further from, M M from MIT perspective, we propose this framework to help us to um, get on the same page about where we're getting to uh, in terms of these kind of transitional um, uh, agreements. Um, I don't wanna go through all the details, but what, what, what I wanna highlight here, particularly important for uh, chemistry fields is that um, if, when we talk about equitable access, we not only mean the access for reading and for human consumption, we also mean the machine accessibility, we mean the computational access and use of the data and the texts. And those are things that we are hoping um, or under a new um, or, or new perspective of uh, talking about the, all these agreements for publishing, uh, we can consider that as an essential part. Um, and uh, because they are um, uh, the terms of the license agreements that would enable uh, text and data mining uh, and uh, the subsequent 
uh, research on uh, machine learning and uh, uh, AI studies. Um, challenges for chemists, I guess, um, uh, we do have, we have made lots of effort to make these agreements happen, but all these terms are very nuanced from publish one publisher to another, and it's such a complicated uh, landscape to navigate. Um, and the retrieval mechanism also varies because the infrastructure um, from different publishers are not the same, um, and we're at different places in terms of uh, making them better. Um, and uh, one more trend I have uh, observed recently is uh, some of our publishers become a little bit more conservative after the hype of all the large language models has brought, um, brought the attention to how powerful the text and data can be uh, in, in, uh, in all these AI driven systems. So, um, but it, it is a concern, um, it is very concernable trend for, for uh, some of our publishers becomes a little more conservative about that. Uh, I'm looking forward to have more conversation with our publisher partners to, to really find a good solution that would work for, for all of us um, uh, together. Uh, and it, um, that, that one last part about the incentives I want to highlight is, is um, uh, this type of uh, sort of additional in, uh, external incentive, like uh, MIT recently proposed this prize for open data. We have done it for two years now. Um, and uh, despite, the fa despite the fact that um, chemistry has been a hesitating area to share our data, we still had plenty of nominations and winners for this kind of open data prize. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of that uh, for, for our community for that. Um, and um, next part, I wanted to really dig into that incentive part a little. All these extrinsic, extrinsic uh, incentives, including the funds, promotion, recognition, um, they, they, can, they are useful, but maybe uh, only go so far. They may not be sufficient to justify the additional time and effort for our chemists to go further with curating their data uh, so that it can, it can be more findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. Um, I learned this from the researchers themselves. So in this study we did um, uh, with a materials science group, um, we heard comments like, we spend the time to take care of our data for reproducibility reasons on, for our group, but it is difficult to justify this, that extra time we need to spend to further curate, curating the data so that others can use our data to publish a predictive model that only benefits their own academic career. And um, that is a very real challenge. And um, they also continue to say that if uh, it could be a very different story, if the data we shared can be uh, immediately turned into automated design in our lab through one of these machine learning or AI models integrated in our workflow. So if, it, if, if um, the, the research output actually benefit their uh, and advance their science, uh, accelerates their discovery um, immediately and make that direct impact to their lab, then um, they would be probably willing to spend more effort in curating those data to be more, uh, you know, more fair to, and share them in a more fair means. And that uh, is really consistent with uh, this uh, more recent report from a, um, National Academy about automated research workflow that we are really at, at the pivot point of making it happen to close the uh, loop between the big data and small data. And that fair data part is uh, critical to close that loop because um, only if people started to dynamically share their data in fair means, all these models could dynamically use them to drive this kind of automated um, cycle. And uh, for chemistry, fortunately, it's already happening. Um, this uh, figure on the right here shows one of the recent uh, collaborative um, publication from MIT. Um, and uh, it, it, this kind of robotic system driven by um, a machine learning AI based model has already happened uh, in the labs at least. So a dye molecule can be designed on the fly and uh, uh, the experimental can be designed and carried out through the AI based, uh, based algorithms. And then the properties of the new molecules are measured you know, on, on the fly. And also then the data feedback into the system to restart a new, new phase of testing. So it's already happening but the foundation for that um, for that is happening 
is because we have our unique language. So the all the all the hype about large language models out there is because um, all these uh, companies. Yeah. Pardon. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'll I'll speed up. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, because we have those uh, unique uh, language in chemistry, we have the chemical structures, we have established the standards, and um, and uh, the, to the, to make those work, we have to really make those experimental. Uh, we have more experiment data with quality, and uh, either generated by tax data mining effort or of of our old treasures, or we need to um, uh, have our researchers to be able to uh, share their data directly. And all, uh, here, this slide just lists some of the standards who has made this happen, including Inchi, Inchi Key, um, our IUPAC effort from the uh, very beginning of, of chemistry becoming a domain, like those terminology um, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, like gold book and, uh, and the format standards like GECAM DX for spectrum. Um, and all these, um, all these means, um, all these standards, uh, along with our unique vocabulary, of chemical structures really build that foundation mm -hmm. for for this out, kind of automated system to happen. So for me as a, a, a science librarian and a data librarian, my mission is really to provide those guidance and support to researchers um, in the practice field. Um, and we do that by adding the chemistry flavors into the trainings for data management and sharing. Um, and more importantly, we want to be able to provide this to specific research groups with the, uh, with, with the flavor of their own research practice. And to make that happen, we re really need those embedded data steward and, um, and uh, data champions in, in, inside of those group to make that happen. And it's not yet happening in the US much, but I observed that in Europe, many of these embedded data stewardship is happening uh, right now. And that really made a huge difference on how individual research groups can save time and build those fair data practices. Um, and I'll skip this uh, one mostly, but just want to say like we leverage those graduate student effort too. And most importantly, this kind of a minimalist approach of making fair data happen before those standards can be integrated in our infrastructure. We can at least share those, um, those documentation about the data, share the code about the data, share the identifiers about the data. Um, with a simple readme file so that eventually when the infrastructure is ready, these informations are already shared and ready to be leveraged. And uh, my last part is going to be about uh, uh, the all community of practices efforts that we are here trying to also build. And all these are what really can, the, the, the communal type of effort really to make things happen. Um, and um, I'll skip this one. And uh, that includes the, the, the further further um, effort in helping our researchers to learn more uh, through different workshops, but also um, uh, help uh, our data curators to understand more uh, about the chemistry specific knowledge on how we can curate chemistry data in the proper way. Um, and uh, we wanna, uh, this is what I feel most proud of recently, uh, Leah and I made uh, the connections happen so that we can allow researchers and work with um, uh, communities of practice like IUPAC to convert all of all, all our old treasures in the reference works into the structured data. And all these instruct, uh, structured data are coming with the curation process and the code people have used it. And that truly made the difference for the reusability and interoperability and a further collaborative improvement can happen across the community. Um, and the, the more examples, you can find them in this uh, cookbook that also Leah has led uh, the effort for. Um, and uh, last but not least, I'll actually skip this one. Um, and of talking about industry partnership and collaboration, I really appreciate, appreciate what Danny has uh, highlighted. And also from the academia side, we really try hard to build those two. Um, and for example, this uh, consortia, uh, I think Merck is also a participant of this, really allowed our researchers to um, really build that um, in investment partnership with industry and give them back some of those uh, return of the investment to give them more insights and collaborative opportunities down, down the road, but also in the meantime, have an open means to share what part that the contributions from the academia side 
um, but so, also still leave the competing edge for the industry partners uh, outside this. Um, yeah, I'll end my um, talk with this quick slides, um, but uh, I saw this um, in at the airport um, of IDA uh, yesterday um, when I came in. And uh, this is the advertisement for uh, this particular uh, um, uh, data management system. And um, they say that focus on the science, not the data management, but I want to argue that the data management sharing is really essential for the advancing the science. So we should also spend time and effort on it. And I'm glad that we can, I can contribute to that effort to support that kind of effort to happen. Thank you very much. I'm very out of time. Thank you, Yi, very much for that. And another whirlwind tour of all the things that are going on. This is a very exciting time. Um, uh, one more speaker. Thank you, Shannon, for <laughs> filling in our last spot. So we'll have another perspective from um, additional library services that are being made available. I think uh, our goal here is to really emphasize, um, you know, so many activities that are happening uh, and and how many different partners and stakeholders can facilitate this collectively for the research community. So to help support that <laughs> perspective, I'm inviting um, Shannon Farrell to the, the podium. Shannon is the research data services lead and the director of the digital repository at the University of Minnesota. Um, I believe she's also a lead on the data curation network um, as, as well. And before becoming a librarian, she spent over a decade working on large scale data intensive research projects um, in the fields of ecology, animal behavior, molecular biology, systematics, Wow, entomology, sustainable agriculture. Wow, this is great. I love this. Um, it's all the things you can do with uh, data-driven research. <laughs> um, so she leads the Minnesota University's research data services team, and this group is focusing on this campus-wide education and consultation around data management and data sharing. So thank you so much, Shannon, for bringing your experience. Yeah, so I'm going to start off by saying I am not a chemist, uh, <laughs> but I do work with a lot of chemistry researchers in my role at the university. So my talk today is really going to focus on the University of Minnesota perspective, um, hopefully to serve as a guideline of what other institutions could be doing. So um, as Leah just said, the research data services that I'm in, um, in charge of at the University of Minnesota is a group that does campus-wide education and consultation around data management and data sharing. Um, and we also run our institutional data repository. So, nope, there we go. Okay, so um, research data services, although it's housed mostly within the university libraries, is responsible um, for coordinating campus-wide education around data management, data curation, and data sharing. We do have many campus partners, um, however, including a group called Lattice, which is the Liberal Arts, Technology, and Innovation Services. We also work closely with sponsored projects administration, the Institutional Review Board, Technology Commercialization, the Office of Information Technology, the Data Science Institute, and several others. The role of RDS is to develop and implement data services and education for faculty, students, and staff. We are actively involved in national and international conversations around data management and data sharing. This includes interacting and responding to those federal requests for information um, from the federal agencies, which we have been doing for several years to share the University of Minnesota's perspective and the needs of our research community. Okay, so what do I mean by data services? As I mentioned before, our work is centered around data management, data curation, and data sharing. This includes helping researchers figure out how to best preserve their data sets for the long term. What does that look like in practice? It can be one-on-one -on -one consultations with researchers, reviewing researchers' data management and sharing plans, doing a variety of group instruction activities, and holding various outreach events, um, such as during Love Data Week, which was just uh, during February 14th, um, or Research Ethics Week. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here to talk about what our data management instruction looks like. We do sessions for large groups on campus, including departments, centers, or specific research interest groups. These have covered a wide range of topics, but most recently have focused a lot on how to write a good data management and sharing plan, or what the data sharing expectations are for various funders. 
We also conduct sessions for smaller groups, such as an individual research team or a lab, where we focus on topics such as how to manage data together as a group, um, going over various storage and backup scenarios, or how to manage data during a research project. We also teach directly within courses, usually those that are upper level undergraduate or graduate courses. These most often are teaching general data management concepts or focus on particular aspects of data management and sharing, such as around human subjects data as one example. On an annual basis, we also provide data management boot camps for early stage graduate students. So meaning they're either in year one or year two of their degrees. These boot camps are focused on data management basics, which includes file and folder organization, risk management, storage and backup, and how to provide good documentation. Beyond this, we try to teach different topics based on what we've identified as current needs. So last year, for example, we covered citation managers, workflows and tools for backing up data and versioning, information around federal data sharing mandates, and data publishing. We've been providing these boot camps since 2013, so when that original um, OSTP memo came out, and we've only seen the need grow. So just one thing to point out here, these sessions used to be in person, but we switched to virtual only in August 2020. Um, red on this graph is the number who registered and yellow is attendance. There's always some attrition. <laughs> in 2021, we also offered a boot camp specifically for graduate students in the College of Science and Engineering. So this includes uh, the discipline of chemistry. This was based on an identified need for these students and high enrollment of students from these departments in our general data management boot camp. You will notice a similar theme in what was covered to the general data management boot camp with some additional focus on lab notebooks and physical samples. It was well attended with 42 students from all stages of their graduate school career from that college. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about our data repository now. So this is what DRUM or the data repository for the University of Minnesota looks like. We're free, open access, and any University of Minnesota affiliate can deposit their data here as long as it fits within our guidelines. The guidelines are mostly around size and human participant data. We are not equipped to handle big data at the moment, and we do not offer any restricted access. So we have policies around private and sensitive data. We also do require curation of the data, which means that a subject-specific expert will look at the data to make sure that the file is open, that it is adequately documented so that someone else can reuse it. That being said, much of our work re involves referring researchers to other repositories. If you look at guidance from, say, the National Institutes of Health, they often say that re researchers should look for discipline-specific repositories when trying to identify a place to house their data. This is guidance that we also give to our researchers. DRUM, in many cases, is a last resort because of a, if a disciplinary repository exists for your kind of research, that may be the best place for your work to be deposited. The University of Minnesota is also the financial house for the data curation network, and Michaela Narlock, the director, is employed with the University of Minnesota. The Data Curation Network, as the name implies, is a network of institutions, so 19 in total, that comprises over 50 data curators. The Data Curation Network is important to know about because it contributes to the national conversation around data curation and data repositories. Essentially, they connect data specialists to knowledge that allows them to support researchers. An example of this is the database of primers that they've created. Um, one example that applies to chemistry researchers, which we just talked about in our last talk, um, would be the mass spectrometry um, primer, and you'll notice a familiar face as one of the authors. <laughs> so, um, let's see, sorry. And ex uh, whoops, got to move on here. So all of our primers are public on the web on GitHub. Um, they all have a similar structure, part of which is highlighted here, and I know it's hard to see, so I'm sorry about that. Um, it describes common file formats, known repositories, recommended open formats, how to convert files, and so on. So for curators like myself, these primers help us understand the common types of data found within different disciplines. 
As I mentioned before, the DCN is comprised of 19 member institutions. We all serve as resources to one another. What this looks like in practice is if, say, the University of Minnesota receives a data set for Durham that we either don't have the expertise or time to curate, we can send it over to the DCN, who will then work to find a curator from a member institution to curate it for us. Um, they will look at the data set, open the files, and then make recommendations for ways to make the data set more fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable. Our local curator will then send on those recommendations to the UMN researcher. So it really is a wonderful asset for us to have access to the DCN. Another output and contribution from the data curation network is the curated model of data curation. Curated stands for check, understand, request, augment, transform, evaluate, and document. This is a model that we follow, follow when we are curating data sets in, at UMN. We check the files to make sure they open. We read all of the included documentation. We try to understand the data. Then we request missing information or ask for changes to the data set. We augment the metadata by adding DOIs. We transform any file formats for um, use using tools, so such as converting Excel files to CSV. We evaluate the data set for fairness by looking for licenses and so on. And then we document all the actions that we took by creating a curator log. Now I want to talk about how we have worked with chemistry researchers in DRUM. I'm going to start off talking about our work with the UMN Materials Research Science and Research Center, um, what we call MRSEC. Uh, MRSEC requires that data from the center that's associated with publications around a certain grant be uploaded into and archived in DRUM. We worked with them to create an easy to follow workflow and to establish a collection so that all MRSEC data sets are housed together. Both the collection and the workflow are linked here. So what does that workflow look like from the researcher's perspective? We ask them to follow a few steps. First of all, we confirm that they can publish the data, that it isn't owned by someone else, or it's not trademarked, et cetera. Then they're asked to locate all of the files associated with the publication and to make sure they open. We ask them to make sure that the files are described. We ask them to create JPEGs of ChemDraw files. And then we ask them to organize the files into a logical directory structure. We then ask them to download a copy of our README template and fill it out. The README asks for a description of all the acronyms or abbreviations that may appear in the data. It asks for a description of your data collection methodology. It asks the researcher to describe any relationships between files and to name what software would be required to open or access the data. The directory structure that was generated will also be pasted into this README. After these preliminary steps are complete, they will fill out the DRUM upload form and they will upload their data. They then proceed through the curation process and work with their assigned curator to finalize the data set. Once curation is complete, they receive a DOI to add to their manuscript. The workflow on DRUM side when the author deposits, um, the workflow on DRUM side starts when the author deposits the data set. So our drum coordinator will look it over, accept it, and assign it to a data curator. The curator runs through the CUR steps of the curated workflow, and then emails with the author with their questions and recommendations. The curator then waits to get a response from the author. Sometimes that goes quickly. Um, other times it could take months or weeks. Um, once the author responds, the curator can finish the ATED steps of the curated workflow. They'll make any necessary changes, upload those changes, edit the README, and then mint the DOI. The curator then sends the author a final email, noting the changes that were made and telling them curation is complete. We have a similar process in place um, at the University of Minnesota for the Center for Sustainable Polymers. They have this little nifty data sharing timeline that they use to tell researchers when and how to use DRUM and how it fits into the publication and grant reporting process. So you can see um, on this little timeline where you have to submit to DRUM. This is what a finalized data set looks like. Um, so you can see um, the file types um, at the bottom. Um, the DOI is on the slide, so you can look at it if you want. Sorry, I just have to go back here a second. Um, there's the DOI. And these are all of the file types. 
Okay, so I wanted to use these examples to illustrate that even though there may have been initial resistance with chemistry researchers, and there was, <laughs> we have been able to generate buy-in with some high-profile chemistry research centers on campus. These centers now are serving as advocates. The way we were able to do this is to make the process as easy as possible for them. They have detailed instructions and a logical workflow that can be followed. And with the Center for Sustainable Polymers, there was an assigned um, administrative or research support person who could assist with the actual uploading. Overall, we're trying to create this culture of sharing and training the trainers so that it is just another expectation that they share. I wanted to close my talk here to discuss a little bit about what we've learned and what challenges we still have. So starting with the positive, we're all figuring this out together and we are working through it. We've discovered that it is possible to share and disseminate your work or data openly. It definitely gets easier once there is a workflow in place. It becomes habitual. The workflow means there's less work for both of us as curators and for the researchers. It means there's fewer back and forth communications or unexpected questions that arise. These workflows have set expectations for everyone within the centers and there's something that can be pointed to for new hires and graduate students in each of these centers. We have viewed this activity as growing the next generation of scholars, where it means that they will not even question or be resistant to sharing their data because it is just part of the normal process. It's commonplace. On the other side, there are still challenges. So in the last year, we have received numerous questions from researchers about storing and depositing big data. So in, in our case, we define that as hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes in size. This is not something that our data repository is currently equipped to deal with, although we are working on it um, and thinking about it. On our end, we have concerns about long-term storage costs. If we would have to eventually deaccession or removing data sets and what that access would look like for end users. So right now we are promising researchers 10 years of preservation. Can, um, can users on the other side feasibly download such large files if they're at less resource institutions? So that's something we're thinking about as well. We've also fielded questions about providing restricted access. So again, this is not something that we are equipped to do. Our repository is completely open. There have been similar questions about data that's going to be patented or has other intellectual property concerns attached. That being said, more guidance is coming out around that, specifically about what you need to write into your data sharing plan and what kind of timelines should be followed. Finally, as a small but mighty staff of data um, people at UMN, we are concerned about expected growth of need in our services on campus. So as it stands, we're now only working with a small amount of people or departments within the chemistry discipline, for example, and we anticipate seeing more data sets deposited in DRUM and more requested consultations about which repositories um, um, researchers need to use and how to go about curating their data sets. And that is it for me. I just wanted to acknowledge all the wonderful people that I work with at the University of Minnesota um, who contribute to this work and um, who uh, looked through these slides and helped me. So thank you. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, this is our final panel discussion. Um, we welcomed all of the speakers from this last panel to the, to the floor um, to answer your questions and engage in conversation. Um, so in the room, we have two microphones and we already got some folks lined up and then we've already had some um, great questions coming in through chat. I am going to just kick us off. And, um, and if you can speak really briefly, fast forward 10 years, what is this, you know, what is what does this space look like um, from your perspective with, you know, with the kind of directions of, of your projects and your, and your work that you're doing your professional work? Let's start. Let's just go this way. <laughs> okay, that works. I if I think about first of all, ten years ago, compared to like now, um, you can see how um, I want to say ten years ago, uh, getting all the information you want on a on a cell phone was probably not something that we were thinking about, and uh, I I am thinking that. Uh, if you go to the future and we think about 10 years from now, there will be some technology that we are not even aware of. One of the uh, most fascinating things that I, 
that I've seen recently uh, is um, to be able to um, connect to ChatGPT with your thoughts. That's like a one one that I uh, found absolutely uh, uh, amazing. So I can only imagine what that is going to be um, in ten years. So you can access uh, knowledge and a lot of information just by. Uh, let's say Googling something with your thoughts and that, that it's, a, a I, I think the future is, uh, is going to be really interesting, but also terrifying. Right? Yeah. I was going to kind of go along the chat GPT lines as well. Um, it's something that, um, I didn't have the opportunity to mention during my talk, but we use electronic notebooks and we do a lot of high throughput experimentation where we're generating reams and reams of data. And we try to connect that data into our notebooks. How are we ultimately going to be able to search that today, tomorrow, 10 years from now? I, I hope in 10 years we're able to use a chat GPT or some sort of AI to just, you know, put in a scheme and it pulls up all of the reactions that have previously been done. You can extract the data, you can reuse it. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping the future holds with respect to that. Um, my thought is also along that line, um, but I uh, wanted to emphasize my hope is on the interoperability part. When we break the silos, things can really happen in the way that we're hoping it to. Um, when go back to earlier what Louis was mentioning, the easy, easy of use uh, for Sci-Hub really rooted in that they, they really break, break, break all the silos, although in a not legal way, um, and also uh, the underlying, inter, underlying interoperability really made things happen. And if in 10 years, we could have our system truly incorporate, like including electronic lab notebook system, uh, or now sometimes sometimes people phrase it as, as research data management system. If all those things have and the underlying standards um, happening, and if all, all of our researchers have good practices to share their data in a fair way um, more, more um, broadly, and then eventually that kind of system can become true. And um, the, it's a, the, the, in addition to the large language models, we do need those quality experimental chemistry data to power those systems. So I'm, I have hope in 10 years. I'm really gonna bring it back to a university perspective, just um, thinking about our campus um, more specifically. So uh, what Elaine said yesterday, um, there are never enough people. We really need to ramp up our staff. Um, I also um, really think that we need, so one of our goals this year is that we really reach out more across campus to other people that are doing data-centered work. Um, we know that there's lots of silos occurring across campus. We know that there's a lot of duplication of work occurring across campus. And so we're really trying to find all of those partners within the research process. It's why we work with um, the IRB and Sponsored Projects Administration just to get the pulse of what's going on so that we can meet those needs. But just thinking about our data repository, um, we want to grow that in ways that are, we actually are meeting the needs. So as I said in my talk, there's a lot of times where we have to turn people away because our technology doesn't do what we need it to do. And I don't want that to be a barrier anymore. Um, and finally, just being here and learning about all of the international efforts that have been happening, I really would like to be more involved in that. I think we can... Um, learn a lot from each other and start establishing really good, we always say good practices, not best practices um, <laughs> at, our, at our institution. So um, yeah, that's that's my answer. Awesome. Thank you for the practical viewpoint there. <laughs> uh, let's move to the floor, Marty. Great. Thanks so much, Marty Burke from University of Illinois. Uh, thanks so much to all of you. It was a really fascinating session. My head is kind of spinning, uh, thinking about if you play this all out, right? Imagine everything that was talked about this morning, synergizing to create new things being possible. Uh, I think it's really interesting to kind of go there. So kind of consistent with Leah's question. Think about it, there's 8 billion of us on the planet and maybe the one thing we can all agree on, everybody wants to be healthy. And we think about the power of medicines to help make the world a healthier place. Maybe I'll start this question to Danny. It'd be interesting everyone's thoughts. Can you imagine a way that everything we've been talking about comes together to create a world where discovering new medicines is everyone's 
business. We can find tomorrow's medicines together through a kind of democratized drug discovery initiative. And how might we actually make something like that happen? Yeah, it's a really great question. And um, it's something that we've been thinking about and trying to engage in whenever possible. And so um, there are a lot of diseases out there. Um, every company has to prioritize their own pipelines, their own portfolios. And so obviously we, we, we can't do it all. And so as a means to broaden the impact and reach, if we're able to engage with um, the academic community or with other practitioners around the world, that would really be um, enabling. And so I think with that said, uh, you know, we have been part of a few different uh, partnerships. So with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we've, um, you know, leveraged that collaboration to bring forward new malaria drugs. That's been really successful. I think another area uh, that we are interested in is, uh, is the antibacterial space. I think a lot of companies have walked away from, um, have walked away from antibiotics. However, resistance continues to grow and our toolbox continues to get smaller and smaller. And so I know that there are, um, you know, different acts um, going on in Congress. I think it's a pasture act. It's, it's, it's been kicking around for probably 10 plus years as a means for the government to help fund and kind of kick off uh, some of these drug discovery efforts within the antibacterial space. Uh, and so I, I think it's totally possible to have it done um, for the group that I work in, we do a lot of peptide research, and I think peptides are made out of amino acids, which is a beautiful way to collaborate with the academic community in parallel, where you have them working on amino acid chemistry. They have no idea what the composition of matter is, but we're able to kind of like leverage that community to help us design the amino acids that we're interested in and bring those tools into our company in order to advance the peptide therapeutics. Thanks, Danny. And may I add one more aspect to that? Um, when we when it comes to the health science data, um, I guess one thing uh, is important is people's privacy and ethical use of uh, the health science data. So that's another part I feel um, the academic sector and industry can really collaborate together to figure out how do we use those health science data uh, along with the, the chemical data um, uh, in a more ethical way so that um, everyone is protected, but also make progress together. Um, so as people may or may not know, the NIH um, is requiring data sharing, um, <laughs> data management data sharing for all of their grants now. Um, and one when that came about, which was January 2023, there was a lot of, and I'm going to use the word panic on our campus about what that meant for um, the health sciences researchers. And what we've found now that we're, you know, a few months out is that it actually is possible that we are sharing, you know, they are sharing their human subjects um, research. And I think that is just going to be a, another thing that we have to work through. It's de-identified, of course, we are maintaining privacy and confidentiality, but, but it, but it is happening. Um, and so I think that will just lead, pave the road for this sort of thing um, alongside industry. I think the idea of a crowdsourced drug discovery process is uh, fascinating, right? It's something that probably you would not <clears throat> think about uh, many years ago, but if, uh, as we were saying yesterday in the discussions yesterday, uh, with this idea of uh, 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 a micro release of information, if you have, let's say, a particular reaction to test and you can have uh, many different uh, enthusiasts that are participating in different places and they're testing the reaction in uh, with many different conditions, let's say, uh, uh, and everything is done at the same time. Uh, this All this data can uh, lead to the discovery of a, of a new transformation uh, like that. I, I don't think there are any examples of crowdsource um, research results uh, yet, but it's probably something that will happen very soon. Awesome, thank you. Great, thanks for that. Um, I have a follow up question on chat related to this, and you know, I, you mentioned Shannon the public access policies, and you know, we have this potential of research directions and collaborations with industry and government labs. You know, how is that? Any, any further thoughts on how those policies are going to impact those collaborations going forward? Especially if the mandate has to apply to all authors, for example. <laughs> Looking at Danny, but go ahead. 
I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, it's something that I'm not part of those circles. However, uh, I'm sure that those discussions are are, are definitely taking place. Um, so I, I think when we've engaged in collaborations with the academic community for science, for chemistry, I would say that it is frequently the academic institution who is the more conservative um, party within these agreements being authored. And there's a lot of concern about IP and licenses where um, you know industry just wants freedom to operate with whatever inventions come out of these agreements. So um, the agreement process can take a really, really long time uh, because of that. And it's usually because of the academic institutions. Uh, and so I would say that if we are going to engage in more open access drug discovery, all hands on deck and building these teams, I think um, it's going to require um, industry and academia to come together with what terms are reasonable in order to pursue that and to, uh, you know, collaborate and to make the data as accessible as can be. You know, we, 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 we don't want to hinder uh, the availability of our data. We currently have processes in place for um, folks in the healthcare industry to reach out to our company and access our clinical trial data if it is not accessible. We have a whole workflow for that. And so I would imagine that um, if this were to proceed forward, we would just find um, more workflows in order to get that done. Um, I, I would think that uh, the mandates are made to create a change. And then what people will actually end up doing is, is a mystery. And in the next uh, few years, we will see the result. And by now, we don't know. Yeah, um, just want to add what, um, from my perspective, uh, this is not a binary choice. Um, there is, uh, there are ways to really make tiered sharing happen. And um, uh, I didn't have time to really go through the details of the, one of the examples I mentioned for the industry and academic collaboration. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely respected that everyone needs to um, have uh, the the protection of their intellectual property, and in the meantime, also uh, sharing as much as possible. And so, it, our researchers are on that route already. They found ways to, for example, if it's a machine learning AI study, they find ways to share the part of the model where it's trained by the data that is publicly accessible. And um, but for the for the for the part of the model that uh, had the data that had in-house data from industry or had data that uh, uh, cannot be broadly, broadly shared, then those can be much more protected and, and only become only available for those uh, sponsors that who supported the research by their private funds. So um, it's still it, there is a balance there that where uh, how much can be shared and how much uh, should be protected. Um, uh, but I, I'm optimistic that uh, as long as everyone keeps an open mind, we can still make progress collaboratively together. And there is a time limit also too on what cannot be shared at some time point. So um, later on, with time going on, just like patents, um, seems that we at some point um, that things can be shared as long as they were shared in the proper way at the beginning with the embargo happening, then um, that that could happen. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with what you said. Um, when we have been working with researchers through their data management and sharing plans, there's been various ways of going about um, protecting data that can't be shared right away, putting it in a restricted database where they can allow a specific point of access um, to individuals. Um, so it's not just oh, it's open automatically and it's open to everyone. That you know there are, are other repositories that exist for that purpose. And in terms of technology commercialization or IP, we have seen quite a few researchers just write in that after a certain time period, then they will release the data, but it still gives them the ability to patent or trademark or um, do what they need to do. So there, there it is. We, as we always say, there's no one answer. There are lots of answers. It's a very gray area and you have to think outside of the box all of the time because there's no prescriptive advice, but um, there are solutions. Thanks for that <clears throat> range of perspectives. Um, one more follow-up on this before we get back to the floor. Um, licensing, 
this was raised on Zoom, and I know it's probably a question a lot of people have. Any thoughts about you know the CC BY or other kinds of licensing is is part of this accessibility and managing the what to share? <laughs> Jump right in, any librarian. <laughs> So that is the license that we usually advise people to use. So it means anyone can use your data. Um, it asks for attribution. Of course, we can't enforce it. Um, it's not binding in that way. Um, but that is the purpose of it. Um, a lot of people are very concerned about, I, you know, I spent years collecting this data. It's mine. I should be able to trademark or copyright it. But this is one way for us to get around that, um, since copyright law does not really agree. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say. Yeah, um, licensing, I, I agree with Shannon that the, the enforcement part is really a uh, difficulty, especially when people use aggregated data to build those computational models. And um, it's almost, for now, um, it, it's almost impossible to recognize contributions from different parties in the traditional way we're looking at citations or um, even if there is a CC BY, it's really hard to count those contributions. But um, yeah, so some of uh, the researchers on MIT campus are seeing that problem too, and they are doing some research and trying to see if there are uh, technical ways to help that. Um, but in the meantime, um, uh, as a practice, I guess, uh, the recognition of people's credit by contributing data should it really become a more philosophical discussion among ourselves. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, and another part of, uh, is, is a part of the conversation is the, the idea of scooping. Uh, it is a real concern. Um, looking at data and looking at a publication are quite different in terms of what people considered as scooping. So um, the licensing part may or may not necessarily have help with that aspect. So. Um, it, it really becomes an ethics uh, discussion uh, very soon. So, yeah. All right, let's go back to the floor. So um, this question is going to run sort of the other direction from these concerns about IP and licensing. Um, and this may be a, a naive sentiment or question, but um, might there be an illustrative example provided by um, the tech industry and in their embrace of open source? Um, although it wasn't always the case, um, eventually actors in that space uh, really adopted and it became the standard practice um, for the tech industry uh, where they, you know, actively work in the open source sphere and uh, reap great uh, efficiency uh, gains from that uh, and then focus on actually um, the uh, distinguishing uh, aspects of their product um, when they're actually trying to market a thing. Um, Arguably, there might even be a greater opportunity here in the case of chemistry uh, in that, um, you know, you still got the tech industry out there making all of those open source products. There's the opportunity to focus on the non-differentiating aspects of uh, processes and products um, from these companies and to sort of develop those in a sort of narrow open source way um, and to have those uh, benefits reaped by everyone. Um, and I guess my question is, why hasn't this been more actively adopted? You know, for example, um, openly sourcing uh, processes, uh, standards, and workflows. Um, and what might be some of the uh, windfalls that could be reaped if this were engaged in actively? I'm going to say that open source um, <clears throat> software is uh, an amazing uh, thing. Uh, back back in the day, where right, you would have companies that are writing. Uh, they have a particular program of software and then open source is uh, there on the site. And I think the big difference is that uh, with code, uh, there is uh, a pretty sp uh, specific thing that is being shared, which is the code, right? So it, it's something that can be um, put out there and there is a particular language and it is a way in which it's, uh, it's done. Um, but with science, it's a little bit more... Uh, it's, it's more challenging because sharing data in in the way it was done with software is a, a bit different. And also in, in terms of software, you do have, uh, I mean, just an example would be Microsoft. Microsoft is behind lots of uh, different uh, open source projects. At the same time, you they have their uh, 
uh, normal programs, but at the same, uh, but they're also contributing to the community. But in this, in our case, uh, in the case of science, it's not the same thing. There is no uh, transition in which the two uh, closed code and open code is are uh, coexisting. Uh, I think in our case, the change is more more dramatic. I don't think it's uh, that uh, that the same thing could apply. Thanks, Luis, and uh, um, just want to add my uh, probably very, very shallow perspective on that. So open source really worked for software, software for one of the reasons is that um, people who build upon those open source software could get their investment, uh, return of investment through providing service-based uh, 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 maintenance or um, customization or other way of service providing. Um, but when it comes to data and also publications, um, we are yet to find a way to define those value-added service to allow a sustainable way for people keep contributing back to to that dissemination system. So um, that is the, the the challenge in my thought. Um, I think we are making progress um, in many sense. Uh, again, like if all sectors work together to try to define what set of value added service where we can allow this system to really self-sustain. And that's the key to get to that. But thanks for a very good question. I think to kind of build upon that, um, I think open source is interesting and we do our best to share what we can with the community, but I think developing a piece of software is arguably more simple than developing a drug. And so even if we're able to share one aspect of the process that we use to manufacture a drug, I think in the larger picture of the drug development process, it's just not, it's just um, a very small window into that. And so I would say like, sure, we can do that, but it requires multiple departments, hundreds, if not thousands of people to ultimately bring something to the end and a lot of different scientific expertise and clinical expertise, medical doctor. So, I mean, there are things that we can share, but, um, and we hope that people can leverage our technologies when they can. But um, I think within the bigger picture, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah, Alejandro Strachan from Purdue University. So the discussions yesterday and the presentations show that there's still open questions and concerns about sustainability of uh, data repositories, uh, even open uh, access publishing. And we tend, when, when we look for solutions, we tend to look at the federal government. And you know, the examples yesterday were all supported by the federal government. And so the first part of my question is, what's the role of industry that can actually benefit from uh, having these open resources and have orders of magnitude more resources than the, the federal government and you know, the, the funding agencies? And so, and maybe to Danny specifically, uh, I wonder, so you showed us the fraction of papers that were open uh, from from your company. And I know you're, you're the only representative uh, of industry, so I don't want to uh, put you on the spot, but it looks to me that uh, necessarily companies, as you mentioned, publish less uh, than academic labs and, and national labs in, in terms of their output for obvious reasons. So it seems to me that it'd be entirely in their uh, advantage to make and support open access and and paying for publication charges. So so I wonder why they're not taking more of a leadership position in uh, the the open science, uh, open access uh, science. Thank you. I can start. Um, so, like you said, I don't want to speak on behalf of all of industry. Um, I would say that. And a point that I tried to make is that we publishing is not our top priority. It doesn't pay our bills. Um, and so while we do it because it is a 
it is part of our values. It's our obligation to inform the community about what we can pursue um, or inform the community about what we are pursuing and to share that information. I would say that we have budgets just like every other institution. And um, within that budget, only a fraction of that is for publication support. And so I think, you know, the fees incurred through open access, while some departments are more than willing to pay them, every department is balancing their own budget and they are weighing various factors. And so, um, you know, our department is more open to open access, no pun intended, um, but other ones, and I don't know if, if I mentioned this or not, um, someone in a different department last week wanted to publish their paper open and they were told no, because the fees were too high, that money could go towards um, sending someone to a conference or it could be used um, for potentially um, other research applications as well. And so I would say that the, the value that industry has in making more of their publications open access is tremendous. And that's why I tried to emphasize that industry already is reluctant to publish as it is. And so the more barriers that go up um, in order to make it more expensive, more difficult, more restrictions, I think you're going to see fewer industrial voices, which I think is a real shame. And so I just encourage publishers to have industry at the tables when these discussions are being had about APCs um, and these open access agreements and maybe industry could engage in these agreements to try to find a way to make sure our research is more accessible globally. Yeah, thanks, Danny. And I wanted also to add like how direct uh, the benefit is to the industry sector can be a very determining factor. And I see that on the data front is what rather easier to see that direct benefit and our, our industry partners actually see that and they are taking the leadership role in some of these areas. For example, the Pistoria mm -hmm. um, is one of the, the, the consortia for pharmaceutical companies to get together to, to leverage the open data um, and also to contribute back to, to open data and partner with um, government sector like PubCam and so on and to, to make it better. So there are areas the industry is taking leadership for the open part. Um, it's just we, we need better ways to show that direct benefit and direct impact. Yep. So I hesitate to say this, but from a librarian perspective, I would say a lot of our values and toward where we steer people and what kinds of repositories we steer people toward, we usually veer away from the commercial ones. Um, and so I think that would just be a something that we would really have to consider the reason being is that you know if a commercial entity decides that they no longer want to do it what does that mean for the data that's being stored there do they have like timelines in place and preservation guidelines that say that they will be keeping it indefinitely or for 10 years or is it more if they decide not to do it anymore you know everything there is at risk and so that's something that we think about all of the time um That's it. <laughs> I just want to say that I thank you, Danny, for sharing that uh, the fact uh, that publishing open access was simply more expensive than uh, than just publishing the normal way. And I think that's an important thing that we should consider. Oh, yeah, that's that's that, that's a real concern. <laughs> I think it, yeah, it's a real concern. And I would say that all the industry as a whole budgets r and d differently. So every company has their own r and d budget. Um, some value it more than others. Uh, you know, I think one type of industry that we haven't heard of, which is doing really awesome research, is the biotech industry, where you know they're um, kind of at the cutting edge of science. Uh, and so I think you know they definitely probably do not have you know significant time or money to spend towards open access efforts. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's another voice that isn't being heard because we're all just trying to do the best we can to get um, our jobs done, so. So just a, <clears throat> a little bit of a follow-up question related to uh, something that came in on Zoom around this topic of, you know, what are other ways maybe then uh, that industry and other sectors can contribute 
um, to supporting open access and, and sharing, um, such as uh, you know, develop helping develop platforms that that you know that others can use, and you know, contributing in other ways. Is thoughts on that? So there are several um, industrial consortia that exist where uh, you know companies are coming together in this pre-competitive space to uh, figure out uh, what like to to figure out what we can share, the best practices, how to uh, formally uh, share this information with the broader community. And so I think you know IQs um, is what they're colloquially called. I think is a really um, you know, potential avenue in order to um, explore that. Great, thanks, Danny. And I know you also had mentioned Pistoy Alliance, and I think there's others, you know, Allotrope, and um, so that's that's helpful to appreciate that industry co um, connection through those those groups as well. Uh, I want to go back to the floor. You've been waiting a long time. <laughs> uh, Thank you, uh, Ralph House from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, this is predominantly, I think, for Yi and Shannon um, and any other librarians that are in this room. But I'm curious how, what kind of interactions you all have with your uh, vice chancellor for research offices. And that you know, in Chapel Hill, they're sort of leading the charge in this space. Um, so I'm just curious, in your institutions, what kind of interactions there are between the VCR office and the library. Um, so I mentioned sponsored projects administration. So that's actually um, a part of the OVPR or Office, office of Vice President for Research. They actually just changed their name to Research Innovation Office. So Rio, um, but same thing. We meet with the director of that, um, the, the sponsored projects administration on a biweekly basis. So we are very closely aligned with them. We know what's going in and out of there. You know, her boss is the um, head of OVPR. Um, so we um, we partner on figuring out who needs to know about what, coming to talk to the con Council of Associate Research Deans, and so on and so forth. So I, and that's a, that is a partnership that has arisen just within the last year, um, but it's been very valuable, and I think on, on both sides. Um, there's a lot of things that we wouldn't have been able to get out to campus without having that um, line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for our campus, um, I, I guess what um, really is the fundamental thing is um, our uh, library director and leadership has worked very closely with the faculty body, um, faculty governance body from the very beginning to make sure that all the policies and direct directions and all the important uh, critical decisions are coming from faculty members. Uh, even though the library is the one who is responsible for for getting it hap making it happen, but um, all the all, all these strategic directions and all these decisions come from faculty driven uh, um, task force and the uh, committees. So that's the first layer. And then um, our director, um, I'm really stepping out of my comfort zone because I'm I'm not uh, involved in those leadership part of the conversation, but. Um, uh, that that close relationship with the, the university leadership makes sure that we are reflecting what the research community is wants to do is the, definitely the key for the foundation. And as Shannon mentioned, we also work with other campus units um, at different levels. And um, at MIT, we um, uh, work with the, the general counsel, with the um, with the um, office for sponsored program, and work with uh, we newly founded the. Office of Research Data and Computing, and we are uh, trying at different levels to break the silos. And all of our in, uh, larger institutions are very decentralized, and we are trying to again break the silos from different levels of uh, yeah. And but having that foundation from the beginning with the faculty-driven decision is kind of a key. Okay, thank you for that, Olaf. Um, actually, before a question, I wanted to follow up on a question that was made earlier about uh, open science and the analogous uh, in, in open source. There is actually, or there was such an initiative um, about, I want to say, 14 years ago around a compound called JQ1, 
um, where there was actually an initiative for open cancer research. Um, if you're interested, there is a TED talk by James Bradner um, on open cancer research uh, and JQ1. But uh, actually, I, I think Harvard Business School might have been even had a study out there that what they basically did there was this, this was the first bromo domain inhibitor that was published and they went to some cro and had like a pound of that made and everybody could write them and would get a sample of that free to use free to operate do whatever you please and the impact of that in literature was tremendous because there was a back-to-back -back paper by gs Hey, yes, GSK, also a bromo domain inhibitor. You look five years on on the citations between the GSK compound and JQ1, and it's like a one to 10 ratio. Okay. Anyway, th but that was not what I wanted to ask about. <laughs> um, we talked a lot about sharing of data, and, um, and I think it, it was Shannon who said that there's a lot of gray spaces and, and you have to kind of figure out each case, how about sharing these agreements? In other words, the models that enable the data sharing. Um, I have in my time did quite a few of them and they all start with the thing, under no circumstances can you make these agreements public <laughs> or it would be so much easier, particular for like a center that, as I'm heading to say, well, you know, here is the agreement we had with company X can we use that as a template for company Y? And the answer is apparently no. Okay, so what are initiatives that could uh, facilitate these kind of, of uh, agreements by saying, here are a few examples uh, how this could be done. And yes, there will probably have to be, you know, change and massage and timelines change, but, uh, it seems to me it's a huge waste of time that everybody starts at square one. So what are initiatives, what are um, things we can do to allow the sharing? Yeah, um, that transparency part is really critical. Um, and uh, I, I was trying to highlight one of the things MIT is proposing that framework for, for publisher agreement negotiation. Uh, one of the key piece is the transparency part um, about the agreements themselves. And there are many historical re reasons the non-disclosure uh, term is in the place. Uh, I, 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 it, does, it will take a while for, for us to adapt any new practices, but the, we, we are putting those effort in. Um, I think one of the key, one of the key um, key factor to make that truly happen is we we at least need to be open to the the, the strongest driving force for us to, for decision making from different parties and if we are not transparent or if we are not open to talk about that then there's no way that we could make the agreement open because then that would reveal our motive the motivations that we don't want to talk about so um yeah, I don't know the solution, but I, I, I think there are multiple forces at this point trying to make that happen. So I have two thoughts. Um, another office on campus that we've been trying to work with this year is the unfunded research um, agreements office. So the ones that not SPA's counterpart where they are working with businesses and it's not necessarily funded through a grant. Um, I think that would be a great place to talk to them to see about the reasons why that they couldn't share these kinds of agreements. On the other hand, um, we have been working with researchers. So um, part of one of our services that we offer is reviewing all of these data management and sharing plans. And so part of that is looking to see what contracts or agreements are in place. Um, and we ask those researchers if they will give us permission to share those on our website. Um, you know, the problem with that is that we're not going to cover every discipline. We're not going to cover every research area, but we do have some examples which would help you know, illustrate to a researcher what they need to do in order to share their data for under certain circumstances. So that is one option. Um, and I know the NIH um, has a great resource of data management and sharing plans as well, examples. 
Yeah, and just sorry, quick add addition to that. So um, again, I was at the data curation conference earlier, and one of the things people talked about is called machine actionable data management plan. And one thing that kind of thing would enable is to sort of have a high level, higher level summary or a redacted version of the data management plan or, or including agreement uh, um, with about the sharing part uh, to, to share, like not, not the whole plan itself, but at least a sort of redacted version and machine actionable DMP can have the potential to make that happen automatically. So, yeah. Um, I can't really speak on behalf of our legal department and why we may decide to share agreements or not. Um, but within our company, we definitely have agreement templates that we leverage so we aren't reinventing the wheel. However, every agreement is so unique that naturally you kind of have to uh, do some of that anyways. I would say I think this is like a really good place where consultants probably come in handy in order to advise on, you know, the structure of these agreements and, um, you know, just having conversations with folks in industry and also academia about what they've done. But before, I mean, uh, we uh, are open to giving suggestions and ideas, but as far as like actually sharing what the actual ag ag agreement was, I'm not sure if I can comment on that. Okay, great. I think that's a really interesting area. I like the reference to the DMPs, see that could bring forward some of this. Thank you for that. Um, Elaine. I have a, a comment and then a question. Um, and this is to Danielle. I think that industry may be underestimating the impact on publishing. And so when I'm often presented a new license um, for journals that, that is much more expensive than before. So when it's to make it open, it's coming up 20%, 25%. The excuse is typically industry. We're going to lose, the publisher saying they're losing the industry revenue. Therefore, they have to tax the libraries, right? And I hear this over and over and over. And so I do think that there is some conversation that needs to happen because somebody's going to pay, right? And I think, I think it's unfair for higher ed and libraries to, to basically recoup the costs from industry in order to support open access, right? Um, so that was my first point. And then my second point is for Luis and this whole, the pirating and all this, like this isn't going to end. Like this seems to be the cost of business, right? <laughs> and so, and I stopped talking about it because it's just, um, it, it's the ease of use that is really part of it. And I'm just wondering, have you, I mean, my biggest worry are graduate students and, you know, that they're going to get in trouble and all this. And we really discourage it quite a bit. The library does a lot to discourage it. But have, you know, I'm sure you've had this presentation in other venues. Like, what are you hearing? Oh, you're not like, what are the administrators? Like, what are people talking about? Because this is, you know, this is part of the calculus. I think that's, again, that's why I think I'm being taxed so much is because they're trying to make up for the leakage that's happening and and I just don't, it sounds like from your presentation, there's no end in sight, like this is just gonna keep going. It's a really interesting perspective, um, one that I didn't necessarily think about and I can see industry having a role in trying to influence other industries to kind of step up and to lean into open access and be part of these agreements I would ask to see the data when they say that industry is, um, you know, the reason why your your fees are going up. Uh, as I showed um, in that publication totals for like say MedChem, uh, that was, you know, not all industry publishes at, at the same clip. And even if you take some of the more aggressive companies such as Merck and Pfizer and GSK, it's like 1000 articles over 20 years, that's, small. It's really small. And so I do wonder, um, you know, is it really industry needs to step up or is it other academic communities as well need to, but I take that as an action item uh, to, to, um, to go back to our company and to hopefully, um, you know, encourage us to lean into some of these uh, open access discussions and potentially um, these license agreements as well. And I mean, I'll just add that I think it's, um, my assumption is you're paying a lot more for the subscription as well. Most so likely. that's, I want to yep. acknowledge yep. that, that you're yep. paying 
more than the libraries probably are. Yeah. And and so again, I'm not putting the onus on you and yeah. the industry, but I'm also saying this is what I'm hearing from a lot of publishers that this is a problem that has to get addressed. Yeah. And um, so I just wanted to bring that up. And, and similar to your talk, which resonated with, with, with me when I talked to our librarians um, and encouraged them to pick up other subscriptions of journals, they say, we can't, we don't have the money to. And so there's journals that we publish in, RSC journals that we don't have access to. So we have to leverage document delivery in order to get the articles that we publish, which is kind of ridiculous, right? So I would say that, you know, we're not, um, we don't have deep pockets when it comes to publishing. And so I think if we think about reasonable fees and practices that apply for academia and also industry, you will have more buy-in ultimately. That's really helpful to hear that. Um, do you do have some follow-up on that, Sarah? Maybe yeah. I, I feel like I should say something here. <laughs> like <laughs> this is a complex problem, right? And this is why this transition is gonna be messy for some time. If you think about the way that ACS pubs revenue is split in a in a subscription world right it's split between academic libraries it's split between government libraries it's corporate libraries and it's pretty much the main sources of revenue right in an in an open access world a lot of that the source of revenue shifts and and we can argue whether you know whether apc is the right model i don't know it's kind of it's kind of one of the the, the dominant model that's out there right now and business models last as long as business models last. But in that kind of APC based world, it means that those institutions that are producing a lot of the research are the ones where the financial burden falls. And, you know, I, I hear the concerns here about like the large publishing institutions, right? You guys are getting hammered. Um, by, you know, by by the amount of research that's coming out of your, your institutions. And that's really great. And there are lots of ways that we are working on and doing this, right? When we, when, when I talked yesterday about these undergraduate institutions, where we say, as long as you keep subscribing, we'll, we'll let you make all of your um, papers open access. I think that's a really interesting kind of model. And it, it, it works in, small quantities, but I think we as an industry have to figure out how to make this work uh, well across the board. And I really welcome more dialogue about what do we do to make it fair? Yeah, and may I ask a follow-up question to Danny actually? So, um, I mean, as we know, uh, RC is aiming at make everything OA um, yeah. by uh, 2026. So when that happens, uh, how, likely do, how likely do you see uh, that industry would still pay back to that process in a different way. Like it's not APC based. Um, and if there is a model to do that, how likely do you think industry would be willing to contribute back to that? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I like yeah. I just don't know. Um, and so again, I'm probably not the best person to speak um, on behalf of our Merck library and all of that and, and, um, and industry as a whole. But I think having us at the table when these discussions are taking place, I think matters a lot. So you're at least hearing our perspective, our concerns, what we care about to ensure that we are doing all that we can to ensure that the that the industrial voice is heard. Yeah, thank you. Being open to that discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Really and helpful. and we are. I know that RSC um, has pinged me recently about maybe having kind of another panel like this in order to hear more industrial voices besides me. <laughs> which is great because I think, um, you know, there's lots to be heard there. So, so I'm an industrial guy. Great. Yeah, so I'm an industrial guy and I was, I frequently was in a position to oversee agreements. It's pretty easy. The motivation is, is it creating long-term shareholder value? And if you answer the question, yes, you get to do it. If you answer the question, no, you don't. And it doesn't matter whether it's advocacy or anything else. It's really pretty simple. It's not a big mystery. And if you can draw that line, then industry will, will fall in and, and support you. We haven't really looked at history here, but I come from Dow Chemical. And if you look at Dow, when it was in its heyday, we were all over the books. Books used to be these things that were the repositories. So like Stull's books on thermodynamics, still out there. There's still the thermodynamics of organic chemistry that were published by the company when 
they had enough excess to allow it. But if you watch what's going on at Google now, right, they've stopped the buffets. They've stopped a lot of the do good for the world because you start coming back to, is it delivering shareholder value? So my diatribe's done. I appreciate that perspective. I appreciate this dialogue. This is exactly what we were trying to foment. One last question, and then I want to allow Louis to get back to the, the pirate. Well, to answer the piracy question, that uh, yeah, we definitely don't want students to get in trouble, and uh, it is illegal to do this, right? To um, just simply get a copyrighted material like that uh, and and share or make money out of uh, out of that uh, is definitely illegal. So uh, when you think about uh, many years ago in the the music industry, for example, uh, when people were using Napster and there were all these. Uh, uh, suits, people were sued for copying a song or, or a couple of songs, and then uh, they had this with millions of dollars in fees for a person or, or going to prison and all that. And then uh, it's a crime that then is so massive that there are so many people doing it that is difficult to enforce. And I think it's exactly what is happening um, nowadays. And maybe it will be something similar to what happened to the music industry. Um, in which new services appear that didn't exist before. And maybe that will happen, but we don't really know. Yeah, and I just wanna add to this part uh, too. So um, from my experience talking to students about uh, Sahab and about the piracy um, part, I think one thing really keeps me hopeful is once I articulate that their action has consequences to the long-term healthy Houses of all of the, the publishing system, they started to say, oh, that makes sense. And next time, maybe they will do differently. So at least I encourage them. So if, if, even if for convenience reason, you use the Sahab source, but still put in your interlibrary borrowing request so that it can be counted and it, some, something can go back to the publishers who made this happen. And it, that, that helps them to make the whole ecosystem healthy. So the, I think my, many students do get that. And um, uh, I guess our our way of education really could help uh, for junior faculty member and also students to think twice before they, yeah. That's a really nice point. Thank you Yi, for reinforcing that. Um, Jake, do you want the last word? We're about to wrap up the panel. Oh my goodness, the last <laughs> word. Well, I, I'm glad I'm here well, because I, I, I promised you that I would bring this up. So um, I'm gonna ask a standards question. Um, we haven't really talked a great deal about standards in this workshop, even though they're looming very large in the open data space. Um, Danny, you, I think you very briefly brought up the Helm system for, for um, designating unnatural amino acids in macromolecules. And um, I want to sort of think about that as a springboard for, you know, are we having enough integrated standards discussions? Obviously, IUPAC is, you know, the, the gold standard, so to speak. But, um, you know, should we be engaging more um, among industry, academia, um, the the various uh, chemoinformatics groups to improve, uh, maybe not even improve standards, but build awareness of standards so that when people are archiving their data, you know, the data are are interoperable. I'll go first when Danny is thinking. So I uh, <laughs> totally agree, uh, Jake. Uh, and I, um, as, uh, I was trying to talk a little bit more about the standards part too, but I guess the key there is really the adoption part. And the adoption is not only uh, for the practitioners, like for the researchers, but really for the infrastructure to adopt. And that conversation really happens in that communal way. And um, I, I, I like so, so for the researchers part, um, what they hope is that all these standards can really be behind scene and so they don't have to worry about it. Um, but that as, but as you said, the awareness part, if they don't they are not aware of those standard matters, then they can't really bring it up as a as a requirement or, or as something that they need with with the infrastructure builders. So 
that's the part that I think education part that I think we can do more about. I think it's a really great question and it's something that I don't know why it's so hard to come up with a standard harmonized vocabulary across different disciplines. And so I did mention the amino acid codes. I deal with that on a daily basis and um, it is, um, you know, it's mind blowing to me why we have different companies coming up with their own vocabularies. And I'm not sure why that is. And so I would love to have more discussions. We wrote an article um, a year ago on the potential um, opportunities and pitfalls of, of non-canonical amino acids. There's been papers on Helm. We've been trying to engage with the industrial community on like how we can come together on this and it's been crickets. So I'm not really sure um, what's behind that. And so, yes, I think we need to do more there. And I think that some industries have an appetite. And I think the more that you start to publish and start to see these things, probably the more adoption occurs because it just becomes more commonplace. Thanks for this. And I, I'm actually going to switch my hat really briefly here because actually Helm, thank you for mentioning it, uh, was recently brought to IUPAC um, from the Pistoia Alliance. It was originally developed by members of this Pistoia Alliance to facilitate exchange um, in a pre-competitive way. Uh, and and But the Pistoia Alliance has been very successful about uh, pulling together industry groups to you know, initiate projects um, uh, of shared interest, but they they have definitely made the decision that they don't do a long-term sustainability. So IUPAC was their go-to place. And <clears throat> we're currently putting together a sustainability plan uh, for continuing uh, development and community support, uh, you know, community engagement with the development of HELM. So, it, you know, it is, we are trying and we realize that this is probably a, you know, that co community coordination is is so vital both to how that standard came together, but also carrying it on to be a useful tool. And so I've just, it was just a <laughs> great segue. Thank you for that. And I'll put my other hat back on and and finally give the last word. <laughs> so we had discussions over the break about following the money. So I've learned a couple of things in my life and one is follow the money. And certainly Sci-Hub was a curiosity to me because I couldn't figure out where the money was coming from. But it turns out they published their, their finances they run the whole site for like 13,000 a year. It's the largest, as you, I think you stated, largest repository of pirated data anywhere, way bigger than the PDB, which I think we learned had a $10 million a year. So it is curious to me how these places are going to get funded, how they're going to remain funded, because you talked about you don't like commercial entities because they could disappear. I don't understand how you ha can't worry about having a non-commercial entity disappear too if the funding runs out. But in Sci-Hub, it was a kind of an interesting thing that uh, somehow they're getting by on a really shoestring budget, all with relatively small contributions, if you believe them. So I don't know whether you've looked into their finances. I did not look into the finances of Sci-Hub, but uh, it is definitely um, low cost. That's that that is the that is the idea. One of the, um, I think the important aspects is how all the data is actually being um, copied constantly. And many people have different um, copies of all the, the, the collection of PDFs because there are uh, out there, there are lots of um, data hoarders, people who just are simply have that, that hobby that is uh, storing, preserving uh, data for the future. And, uh, having a, a, a server at home is something that is appealing uh, to them and collecting as much information as possible like is uh, and sharing it is is actually a hobby and that uh, how uh, how that's a, a, a community that is out there that uh, is very supportive of initiatives that have to do with sharing uh, information back when uh, sci-hub had all the legal issues, and that's, that's the, the interesting part about it, right? Is oh, this website is, uh, exists, uh, SciHub. It has uh, uh, there's a lawsuit, and the first uh, reaction to that is let's save the information. So then uh, the, the pirate community just is into just rescuing all the data. So then more copies are made, and uh, the, the 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 code is protected and all that. It's kind of there are so many copies out there. That that is uh, uh, to me what I uh, what is what is fascinating about it. 
that uh, for no cost because the, the data is preserved by volunteers. Uh, it it somehow the, the system is preserved by by doing that. Even if a copy is erased, somebody will have a copy of it. Um, sorry, I just also have to add, SciHub is of course you know dogged by rumors that it's supported by Russian intelligence because they're using the credentials to break into universities and steal data. So that would. That is. And just just want to point out that the obvious too is um, their low cost is because all the rest of the cost is covered by others. So yeah, that that's the that's the interesting thing about it. It's like oh, we they they are ordered to close the site, but the site is still there, and it uh, is very difficult to to enforce. Okay, I do want to leave a few minutes for wrap up and we don't want to let people go at, at, at noon people probably want to get on with their weeks and. Um, but just to that that very last little conversation I just reinforce what you just said I mean sci hub is possible because the metadata that goes along with those um, articles has been developed and curated and normalized in the Community right our citation our citation metadata um, and and. and and that is done by publishers. It's done by the scholarship community when when they submit. So it is a lot of, uh, and that's what when when we talk about interoperability and and documentation, that's what we mean. And so that play, you know, it's great that it's convenient, and that's a value add that's being built on um, on the metadata that's already available. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, to me, when I think about this future, that's the, you know, it, there's the the part about the the create, you know, the generating the data from robust research and documenting in such a way that you know both uh, exploratory areas, but also a lot of functional, practical workhorse resources can come can come out of that. Um, you know, I think, and and again, SciHub is a is a great example of what can be done <laughs> um, when the metadata are made available and, and are, are, are consistent. I, I think that, so. uh, yes, it is illegal and all the data was stolen and it is, it is a terrible thing, but I, I find it very interesting how SciHub kind of provided a, 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 a glimpse of what a world of uh, open access would look like. You just simply, oh, I simply have access to all the information I want, and I change the URL, and there it is. That's what I was looking for. That uh, that is uh, absolutely crazy. Interoperability really at its success. All right, um, I think we want to close out the the conference. I just want to really thank um, all the panelists on this panel, and then uh, all the speakers over the last couple of days. It's just fabulous to hear everybody's actual experience um, working in you know all around data and and scholarship. Um, yes, chemistries, chemistries a both a long tail but a long term science. And I mean, I think we have. I, I I love this field because we accumulate knowledge is has value accumulated knowledge, so we can just keep at this for another few hundred years. <laughs> And, and move towards the best practices possible to keep um, the knowledge flowing and advancing. So thank you so much to all of these panelists and all of you for your questions and the discussion. And I'll just...